Good evening and thank you for joining us this evening for the 2014 North Campus Dean Spirit Award celebration in honor of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I'm Daniel Washington, Associate Dean for Faculty and Multicultural Affairs at the School of Music, Theater and Dance. And I'm pleased to welcome you to this important celebration. David Tarver arrived at the University of Michigan in the early 1970s as a transfer student from General Motors Institute, which is now known as Kettering University in Flint, Michigan. Here at the University of Michigan, David looked forward to a rigorous curriculum and an enjoyable and full college experience. He found both. Although he faced some challenges, as do all students, he did well in his classes. He also made friends with students from very different backgrounds. He earned, uh, excuse me, he interned on campus at the Environmental Research Institute of Michigan. After completing his undergraduate degree in electrical engineering, David remained on campus and pursued his master's degree also in double E. Meanwhile, he took a small business course at the university as he continued to work on a long-standing ambition to combine his interests in music and technology to create a music synthesizer and to start his own electronics business. After completing his master's degree, David had to, de had to decide between a PhD fellowship offer from the University of Illinois or a prestigious job offer from Bell Labs in New Jersey, and that's when Bell Labs was in its heyday. He chose Bell Labs, and after seven years there, he launched his company. It didn't have anything to do with music, I have to say, or very little, but it was in, um, in the electrical engineering electronics area. Telecom analysis systems produced a particular piece of hardware that I won't tell you about. And in 1995, David sold TAS for $30 million. This was before the current craze of entrepreneurship. David just did it himself with some friends. In 2001, David founded the Red Bank Education and Development Initiative. This was in Red Bank, New Jersey. This was a nonprofit that stimulated significant academic performance improvements among young people in his community. Two years ago, he published his life story in the book titled Proving Ground. David has demonstrated a deep ongoing interest in the University of Michigan community, providing support as an entrepreneurship lecturer in the College of Engineering. This is not just an occasional lecture. Dave is teaching two courses this term. Also as an advisor and as a member of the University of Michigan and College of Engineering boards. And finally, as a significant philanthropist, David has endowed the Fred and Louise Tarver Scholarship. We're honored to have David with us this evening to present this year's North Campus Dean's Martin Luther King Jr. Spirit Awards Reflections. So David, if you could please come forward. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Dean Munson. And since the student isn't here, I'm going to set the stage, if you don't mind. I was born by the river in a little tent. And oh, just like a river, I've been running ever since. It's been a long, a long time coming, but I know a change going to come. Oh, yes, it will. See, it's too hard living, but I'm afraid to die. I don't know what's up there beyond the sky. It's been a long, a long time coming, but I know a change has got to come. A change has got to come, yeah. I've been, <laughs> thank you. I've been singing that song every Martin Luther King Day for the last 20 years, but usually in the shower. <laughs> um, as Dean Munson said, uh, you know, I have this business career, and I have a collegiate career, and I have a post-business career, but what I want to talk to you about today is 
the civil rights era, the civil rights movement. Uh, and I want to tell you about it from the perspective of a kid from Flint, Michigan, and what it meant. And I want to bring it forward to what it means today and what it may mean in the future. So I want to start by talking about my parents. My father, Fred Douglas Tarver, served in the Army in World War II. And he was discharged in 1945. And I have his discharge papers right here. Uh, my father served in the Signal Corps in the Aleutian Islands. He was trained in radio and electronics during that posting. And I, I noticed a few interesting things. And, you know, I didn't see this uh, uh, discharge papers until well after my father died. He never talked about his uh, Army experience with me. But one of the things you notice is that my father uh, went to communications school in the Army. He spent 13 weeks, and he became a radio operator, again, out in the Aleutian Islands. And another thing I noticed from his discharge papers is that he got the normal kinds of uh, medals and awards that you get uh, during Army service. He was a good soldier, and he was honorably discharged. But the thing that kind of set the tone for my father and actually set the tone for my career was this. You notice his occupation up top. He was an insurance salesman. Uh, he worked for a black insurance company in Albany, Georgia. And when he came out of the Army, he still worked for a black insurance company from Albany, Georgia. Because despite the fact that he got that training in the Army, he was not able to secure a job in electronics when he came out of the Army. My mother, Claudia Louise Tarver. Uh, you can see where I get my good looks from. <laughs> uh, my mother uh, was also uh, in Georgia at that time, in the late 40s. And my mother had a career as a nurse. She began her career as a nurse um, by going to school uh, at Grady Memorial Hospital in Atlanta. And again, I didn't see this. Uh, I never knew about this diploma until a few months ago when we were moving my mother out of her condo. I, I found this diploma, and the thing I found notable, even though I knew about it, she went to the Grady Colored School of Nursing. It was a segregated time. It was a segregated system that we had in this country uh, in those days. But, you know, despite that fact, her education was progress. She was moving ahead. And so my father and my mother, a few years after that, this was, I guess my mother got her diploma in 1948. A few years later, uh, a child was born <laughs> uh, in uh, 1953. I came along. And 1953 was an interesting time because it was right before the Brown versus Board of Education decision, the beginning of the successes of the modern civil rights era. But 1953 was also a great and unusual year for another reason. The Detroit Lions were the <laughs> NFL champions. <laughs> but you know, one thing you notice about the Detroit Lions in 1953, there was not a single black person on the team, the staff, I imagine the trainers, nothing. No black person, no Hispanic person, no Chinese person. <laughs> you know, that's the way the world was in 1953. Uh, so, again, I came into the world at this time. Now, I want to indicate that there was some progress, even in football, in those days. That's the Michigan Wolverines in 1953. Progress! Whoa! <laughs> what do you know? Uh, you know, and no one would say today that black people couldn't play football. Black people couldn't play sports. Yet, we weren't represented at all. It was a segregated system. 
Uh, but again, there is a little progress in 1953. So, you know, growing up in Flint uh, had its pluses and minuses. There were issues like the segregated society that we were living in, but of course at that time I didn't recognize anything about that. All I saw was that I was living in a boom town. <laughs> this is a parade that took place in Flint. I think it was 1955. Uh, it was the celebration of the shipment of the 50 millionth Buick automobile. And as you can see, the streets are full, there's a band. I mean, this was a great time to be alive in Flint, Michigan. Uh, and you saw progress all around. And so again, as I was growing up, that's what I saw. I also saw something else. I saw a tsunami of progress in the form of the civil rights movement. I saw it on TV, mostly. But I was inspired by the fact that things were on the move. You know, you felt like things were actually changing, that life was going to be better, that opportunities that I would have would be more than the opportunities that my father had. So around that time, that's me uh, growing up in Flint. And I absorbed this interest in radio and electronics from my father because my father brought home books. I don't know where he got these books from, but he had books on transistors and vacuum tubes and lasers and uh, Van de Graaff generators and all kinds of esoteric electronic things. My father by this time was working as a postman, but at home this is what he did. This was his interest and he pursued it. He didn't let anything stop him from pursuing it. He was also a fisherman. He was also an avid golfer. He did what he wanted to do despite the times and despite the fact that he could not get a job in the field that he loved. So this rubbed off on me and my brother, and my brother built one of these Van de Graaff generators in the bedroom and tried to get me to touch it and have my hair, which I don't have anymore, stand on in. Uh, but uh, it was a great time because, again, we felt forward movement. There was another tsunami that was occurring, and it actually started at Bell Laboratories in 1947 with the invention of the transistor. And for those of you who are not electrical engineering people, which is probably most people in the room here, the transistor is the basic building block of the integrated circuit, the microcomputer, all of the advanced electronics that we use today, the thing that allows us to carry a telephone in our pockets. You know, if it wasn't for the transistor, none of that would be possible. And this transistor was invented by these three gentlemen at Bell Labs. And because of my father, I became aware of that development. So in high school, I entered the Flint Science Fair all four years of high school. And I was a finalist all four years of high school. And my project in my senior year was aimed at determining the effect of gamma radiation on the characteristic curves of transistors. And I used the gamma radiation source down here at University of Michigan to generate that radiation. And so again, uh, despite the fact that I was alone, uh, I, don't, you know, I know who these guys are, especially the guys in the back row, because they were the senior high school people. So I know their names. We never talked outside of the science fair. We never had anything to do with each other. I was alone uh, in that pursuit of uh, that science fair trophy. But you know, again, there was a lot of support in society for this forward movement and from all facets of life. And so for example, in the music of the day, and I know you know you young people don't remember this music, and you older people, I'm sure you do. But you know, if you turn on the radio, you would hear a song like You Can Make It If You Try, Sly in the Family Stone, right? You would hear a song called There's a Place in the Sun where there's hope for everyone. Stevie Wonder, right? You would hear a song all the time. You still hear this song now. Ain't no stopping us now, right? And then my personal favorite, James Brown. I don't want nobody to give me nothing. Open up the door, I'll get it myself. 
<laughs> so, you know, you turn on the radio, and this, all, all of these things were pushing you forward. They were propelling you as a young person toward success, toward achievement. And so, due to those times, due to the changes that took place as a result of the Civil Rights Movement, I was able to come down here to the University of Michigan. <laughs> And I was able to dress any way I wanted to dress <laughs> and wear my hair any way I wanted to wear my hair. That's not a wig. <laughs> that is actually the forerunner of the CEDO office. It was called MEPO, Minority Engineering Program Office. It was in the West Engineering Building, and I hung out there whenever I wasn't in class. Uh, but uh, I was fortunate to be able to come down here to the University of Michigan and to pursue uh, this career in electronics that my father could only dream of, but that I could then, you know, grasp. So after Bell Lab, af after University of Michigan, as Dean Munson said, I went out to New Jersey to work at this unbelievable place called Bell Labs. Not only was the transistor was invented there, the communications satellite, the whole theory of communications, digital communications, came out of Bell Labs. The cell phone, my last boss, at Bell Labs was one of the two guys who originated the cell phone project uh, at Bell Labs. So it was an absolutely unbelievable place for a young electrical engineer to work. And when I stepped inside, I thought I had walked into the future. It was that advanced, it was that kind of place. 6,000 of the most brilliant people uh, whom I had ever met resided in this building in a town called Holmdale, New Jersey. But it was a time because of the Civil Rights Movement where Bell Labs wasn't just hiring one or two people. They were hiring lots and lots of engineers from backgrounds who they had never hired before. Black engineers, lots of Asian engineers. Uh, women started to get their foothold in the engineering field at Bell Labs during these days. So we came in with a wave of people that most of the staff at Bell Labs had not seen before. So for the first time in my life as an engineer, I didn't feel alone. I had black friends who were engineers and scientists and people I could sit at lunch and joke around with about other things other than uh, engineering. And I met other people. I met, you know, one of my best friends today in this world is a guy in, in Rome who uh, came to Bell Labs and, and uh, worked there. And, uh, we had a really eclectic, unusual group. Uh, we had a guy from Italy, we had a guy from China, we had a guy from Hawaii who was Japanese, we had a guy from a, a Castro escapee from Cuba. It was a really weird group, a guy from Jamaica. We had just had a great uh, group. And so I was able to entice um, two of these group members, younger guys who I had actually interviewed. I was able to entice them to come and work in my basement on starting a business. And uh, the fellow on the left, his name is Steve Moore. The fellow in the middle is Charles Simmons, and that's me. And again, we were all Bell Labs engineers in those days. And I had a proposal for them. I said, look, if you will come to the basement and work with me on these, this project, we'll all, be, we'll all be millionaires. And I didn't know if it was going to work out or not, but it sounded like a good thing to say at the time, and it was certainly effective. Now, as an aside, <laughs> as an aside, uh, I don't know if you can, you have to be really old and really nerdy to know what t-shirt I'm wearing, but that t-shirt says, Hewlett Packard, enter is greater than equals, bought mine at Ulrich's. Uh, that was a shirt that I carried out there from uh, Ann Arbor. Uh, extolling the virtues of reverse Polish notation in the calculator. So, again, you music school students, uh, don't worry about that. <laughs> but we were able to get this business started. And, you know, we hired, we started hiring people. And, uh, you know, we had a, because it was me and my buddies who started this company, of course it was a black-owned company, but Everybody we hired, in, none of the people we hired in the early days were black because we were in a, living in a community uh, and we were in a field where uh, there were only so many uh, black folks available. 
But we, we built this company from nothing. Uh, and we started to get some traction in the business. And ultimately, uh, we developed products that we sold in 25 countries around the world. And our largest export market happened to be Japan. And uh, this is a picture from my first visit to Japan in 1987, where we cracked the market there. And I remember uh, from that trip being extremely wary about going into uh, trying to sell in Japan. I'd heard all these rumors about how Japanese people felt about black people, and, and I just didn't know. I was, I, was making, I was giving a seminar to a room full of Japanese engineers from Sony and Matsushita and Rico and all these famous companies I had heard of, Sharp and so forth. And uh, I was very nervous about the outcome. And as I'm speaking, and my translator would translate, I get nothing back, <laughs> you know. So I'm, I'm thinking I'm just not reaching this audience. And so after the seminar was over, I sat down with the fellow who is the second from the left there. His name is Minio Yamamoto. And again, he's probably, well, he's my best friend outside the United States to this day. But at any rate, I sat down with him after the uh, presentation. And I said, Mr. Yamamoto, I still call him Mr. Yamamoto to this day. <laughs> Mr. Yamamoto, I don't think that this is going to work out. Uh, I don't think that you know, the Japanese engineers uh, really responded to me. And I don't think you really understand this thing about race. Maybe uh, it's just not going to work. And he said, look. He didn't say look. He said, <laughs> 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 he said tell them you are from Bell Labs. And uh, so when we got up and finished the seminar, I made sure to mention that Bell Labs, I, I must have said Bell Labs 10 times. <laughs> and uh, lo and behold, after that seminar, 20 of the 33 companies that were present said they were going to buy our equipment. And they followed through and bought our equipment. And uh, it turned out that my pedigree was more important than my persona to them. They worshipped Bell Labs. They worshipped AT&T. They wanted to have a product that was compliant with the standards that came out of there. So moving along, um, we, again, did develop these products. We Again, but the, the thing that's significant about that to me is that I viewed this whole business experience as an experiment. One of the things that was motivating me was the civil rights era, because as we came out of the 60s, my big question was, what's going to be my contribution to the world? I saw all these people marching and working, and some you know, getting hurt and dying in the early 60s. And so I grew up thinking, what can I do? What's going to be my contribution? And I felt that my contribution had to be to establish a beachhead in this field of engineering and to build a successful company, because I felt that if people saw that, that would do more for race relations and advancement than anything else that I could possibly do. So the fact that this business succeeded was not such a big deal from a financial standpoint. Financially, it's great. You know, I have no complaints about that. But the bigger deal for me was that it was possible, and the relationships that we were able to form, and the things that we were able to learn about justifying our product and, and making it in a new market and selling to a bunch of engineers who generally were kind of conservative people. Engineers are conservative by nature. Just ask my wife. So. Uh, as Dean Munson said in 1995, we sold the company to this British multinational called Bothorp PLC. Today it's called Spirant. And immediately after that, I did what every good, successful Michigan alumnus is supposed to do. I gave money to the university. <laughs> and you know, the occasion was one where I learned so much. I didn't go into it thinking I was going to learn anything, but I learned a very important lesson on the day that we had the luncheon to introduce this Fred and Louise Tarver scholarship that was honoring my mother and father. This is a picture from that luncheon. It's very blurry because my scanning skills today were not great. But that's me on the left. That's my mother, Louise Tarver, in the middle, and our pastor, 
uh, Reverend Braxton V. Burgess on the right. And my mother is crying because the weight of all of this sacrifice that she made, she and my father made, was coming down on her during that talk. And she could barely talk, so I'm holding her on one side, <laughs> and Reverend Burgess is holding her on the other side. Well, you know, I wasn't so surprised that my mother cried. That was such an emotional experience for her to know that there would always be at least one uh, student at the University of Michigan studying engineering because of her and my father. That wasn't the most emotional thing. The mo for me, the most emotional thing was when George Haddad got up to speak. George Haddad was the department chair of uh, electrical and computer engineering, and he was the department chair when I was a student here. And I always saw him as Dr. Haddad. I never thought anything about what his background was or where he came from. He got up to speak, and he said, you know what? Uh, I came here from Lebanon. And uh, if it hadn't been for my brother in Flint, Michigan, my cousin, is, or cousin or uncle, I can't remember which right now, hadn't been for my cousin in Flint, Michigan, I would be a goat herder in Lebanon today. But I came here, and I struggled, and I made a go of it, and this guy is the department chair of electrical and computer engineering at the University of Michigan. So that drove home to me that this civil rights movement, and I knew it, I knew it, you know, cognitively, but I felt it viscerally on that day. This civil rights movement was not just about black people. It was about people like George Haddad. It was about women. It was about the Asian people who, in droves, came here, and many of them were working in engineering capacities, but hadn't elevated to management, hadn't really fully uh, uh, become involved in their careers here. Uh, and so when I heard George speak, all of this came home to me. And as I think about it now, I think about the fact that Mary Sue Coleman is president of University of Michigan. I think about the fact that Mary Barra is the CEO at General Motors. This movement that took place in the 60s is really something to be celebrated because it changed the nature of this society for the better. And that's what we celebrate. That's why we're here. That's what we celebrate every year. Not, it's not something about just black people. Uh, it's something about the character of this country that changed and the people who changed it. So you might ask, what now? And you know, I, I really hate that I missed Harry Belafonte's talk this morning because I really have reservations about where we are right now because in some ways we have sped forward and in other ways we have sped backwards. I think about a kid in Flint, Michigan today who was growing up like I did, and I saw progress everywhere I looked. I saw opportunity everywhere I looked. I wonder what a kid in Flint sees today when they look at their world. I wonder what a kid who lives in a neighborhood like this thinks when they see their neighborhood and then they see that gleaming edifice in the background. Uh, we have a lot of work to do, and that's why I said at the beginning, a change is going to come. A change has got to come. But I think we do well to honor these people. We do well, first of all, to honor Dr. Martin Luther King, but we have had people throughout history who have refined the template of what our humanity is about. Martin Luther King did that. Of course, Gandhi did that. I just watched that movie, you know, for like the third time last week. And I'm just so impressed that people can transcend their narrow interests and do so much to advance our humanity. Abraham Lincoln did it. He may not have always done it for the reasons that, you know, we read in the storybooks, but he did it. And certainly Nelson Mandela has done it. And so this template that we have now of our humanity is something that we have to continue 
to refine, to improve. Now, it's easy to say, particularly nowadays, what is the importance of all of this talk about civil rights and Martin Luther King and Martin Luther King Day and Black History Month and all of these kinds of things. Why is that so important? We're in an era where we have so many technological advances, where things are just moving ahead at light speed. We have people talking about things like fusing computers with our brains <laughs> and accelerating our evolution at the speed of light. All kinds of things that are, why is this valid that we talk about this template? Why is it important that we talk about humanity? Well, I think it's important because our humanity is going to determine what these machines do. It's going to determine what our technology does. Why? Because it comes from us. And so as we multiply and magnify our capabilities by a thousandfold or a millionfold, what we're magnifying is the humanity that we have within. And if that humanity is tragically flawed, we're going to be in serious trouble. So we need to get our humanity straight. And that's why, to me, it's so important that we had people like Dr. Martin Luther King set that template for us and give us uh, a direction to head toward. You know, we face choices and challenges in a lot of areas. In the news today, we're talking about what? Uh, surveillance, uh, big data, uh, uh, surveillance drones, and, and war fighting robots, and uh, driverless vehicles, and we have all these technologies, but unless we get the template right, those technologies are going to go awry. So I'll finish up by saying, we can't have a presentation without having some bullet points. <laughs> and so this is for the students out there. So I want to say not what you should do, just is what you can do, okay? And so you can excel in your field. That's the start because it starts with your personal power, and your personal power comes from your excellence. Uh, but you know what? We need to have deep interactions with people around campus, people who we don't know. That's where I got some of my best learning while I was here, was having not just cursory conversations, not a trip to the hookah bar, you know, but having deep conversations about what people are about. Uh, exercise citizenship. Get involved in some problem. Try to solve it. Embrace and engage your peers. Think deeply about why you're here. And, you know, I think that these MLK Spirit Award winners, that's what they do. And I want to congratulate you. And I also want to say happy birthday, happy birthday Martin Luther King. Happy birthday.